Amel uh, Fengor. And Amel is an associate at Herbert Smith Freehills. Um, and she'll be sharing with us an overview of the impact of gender law firms and how firms and individuals can educate, advocate and contribute to positive changes. So welcome, Amel. Thank you so much, Patrick. Can I check whether you can see me? Because I can't see myself at the moment. No, we, ca we can't see you yet. There you go. Yeah. Wonderful. Brilliant. Thank you. Brilliant. There's a bit of a lag there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me. And it's been really interesting to um, hear what the other speakers have had to say so far tonight. Um, so I'm going to focus on gender expectations and bias in the workplace and what firms can and are doing um, and what individuals can do. As we heard from Daisy a bit earlier, gender is a social construct and it leads to expectations of how men and women behave and normative expectations of how they should behave. And however you identify, and I should note that I'm going to refer to men and women here because a lot of the data that I'm kind of going to refer to talks about men and women. I'm not seeking to exclude anybody by using only the terms men and women. Um, but how else, and however you identify male, female, non-binary, you will be impacted by these social constructs. They're deeply in entrenched and pretty inescapable in society. And they find themselves expressed as biases or assumptions. And those assumptions and beliefs about gender drive behavior. I'll give you an example from some of the research in this area. Two uh, American sociology professors looked at a data set that related to 4,000 individuals in the US military. And that's an institution which is both traditionally male dominated and believes itself to be fundamentally meritocratic. Um, and these professors looked at 81,000 performance evaluations and they looked at the words used in those reviews and they found that when it came to objective measures, how much, how many, when, there was no difference in, in um, gender treatment across those evaluations. When it came to subjective measures, however, um, they identified 89 words that were either positive or negative and they were leadership attributes that were used to assess leader performance. There were a couple of interesting findings. They found that men were described with more positive words and women tended to be described with more negative words. Um, and then they looked at sort of the top 10 words that were used for men and women, negative and positive. And focusing on the positive, um, two of the most commonly used words to describe men were analytical and competent. And two of the most commonly used words for women were compassionate and organized. So those are words, but they're not just words. They have real life implications for employees and organizations. Um, and you can see how subtly, subtle use of different sort of gendered behavior can have real life implications um, in relation to work assignment. If you think that women are really good at being organized and tidy, then there's a risk that in a case of deal a project that you will consistently allocate project management roles to women. And if you think that men are better at technical, technical work, then you might organize, um, you might allocate that interesting legal memo, legal analysis to men. You might not realize what's happening because you think, well, I've just allocated the work to the person who's best placed to do it, or so-and-so has done that in the last case they did, so they'll be really good at doing it this time. But over time, that kind of compounds and it can lead to a situation where you're depriving people of having um, a balanced range of experience, um, and that can impact them in their progression. When it comes to feedback, if you're told that you're a leader um, and leadership means all these, these kind of these different gendered attributes, well, you're more likely to behave like one. Um, and if you're not, if you're told in a subtle way that you're not a leader or partner material, are you gonna hang around um, at the firm <laughs> when you, if you think you have no prospects? So language and performance evaluations can tell us what's valued and what's not in an organization. And employees know what's valued and make choices and decisions about how well they fit in an, org in an organization and their potential to advance on the basis um, of that, of that language. So strict expectations around gender don't just impact women, um, men and women, um, and people who are identified in different ways are all impacted um, by those biased expectations of how men and women behave. Women can't even win by behaving like men. If you expect women to be gentler, kinder, better communicators, um, then you might interpret somebody who's behaving assertively, um, confidently, as a leader, as in fact being strident or aggressive. Um, and if I were to ask you to picture a law firm partner or the boss of a company, a CEO, um, are you picturing 
a person or do you um, imagine character traits and kind of fit that to a gender? Um, is that person male? How do they behave? What does it mean for men who aren't like that, people who identify as non-binary? Um, we're all harmed. I think Matt picked up on this. We're all harmed by those sort of gender assumptions and interpretations. Um, and it's important to say this happens at an unconscious level. It's not a question of men or straight men being the enemy or at fault. We're all subject to this and all guilty of holding biases in the way that we think about people and gender. And they're really hard to shake. Um, so that's sort of the problem. How does it express itself in, I've alluded to this slightly by talking about um, issues in work allocation and feedback, but how does it express itself more broadly? Well, more broadly, and I think we've had this mentioned as well, that despite women graduating from law firms um, in the same or higher levels than men, um, that isn't translating into equal numbers at the top of organizations um, in partnership within the equity kind of level of partnerships. Um, and that's a problem because it's a problem for society, it's a problem for the economy, but it's a loss for the organization as well and the individual. And the traditional model of a law firm is pyramid shaped. So losing people kind of up the pyramid is part of the model. Um, not everybody's going to make partner, but you want to retain the best people. And if you're disproportionately losing women, you're probably losing some of your best talent amongst those women. Um, and if you're in an organization that has an entirely male leadership, why would a talented and ambitious female graduate want to join your organization? There's a lot of evidence which shows that diversity, gender diversity and other aspects of diversity is good for individual businesses as well as the broader society and economy. Um, McKinsey do an annual report on gender and they look at organizations around the world and those annual reports have consistently showed that the more diverse organizations are, the better they do in terms of the bottom line. So in their latest report, um, for 2019, they found that um, the, the difference between the top quartile of um, firms, those which have the best representation of women, and the bottom quartile was 48% in performance, which is absolutely huge. Um, and in relation to ethnic diversity, um, just as compelling, the difference between the top quartile and the bottom quartile is 36% in profitability. So it's a really compelling case. And for diversity, so if you don't care about anything else but making money, you have no, you know, you're you're a private organization, you have no, you don't think about what's happening in broader society or sort of at the individual level, then you should care about gender diversity because it will affect your bottom line. It's not just about people being nice to each other and making an environment which is nice and comfortable for everyone. Um, and on that point, environment environments where people are more able to be able to express themselves and bring their whole personalities to work and not feel like they have to play a role and sort of be acting all the time are likely to be environments where individuals feel happier and more comfortable at work and go on to do some of their best work but that doesn't mean that diversity means that you're going to create a comfortable environment diverse teams might feel less comfortable um in fact which is slightly counterintuitive um, but if you imagine that you're surrounded by people who are exactly like you, who think like you, and you finish each, under, each other's sentences, that might be a comfortable, easy um, environment to be in. Um, but that's sort of the problem because you all think alike. You're going to come at problems and solutions in the same way. Um, it's the diversity of opinion and thought and challenge of ideas in a constructive way that makes diverse teams more effective and makes diverse firms perform better. So diversity might be uncomfortable, but that might be a good thing. Um, so that's the problem, um, how it impacts law firms um, and what are the law firms doing about it um, and what can we as individuals do about it. So for firms and institutions, there are two aspects. There's what you're seen to be doing and what you actually do. So being seen to be making changes and actually making changes. And being seen to do things and showing leadership is important. It helps establish norms of behavior. It influences peer firms and clients and the market and um, helps you attract women to the firm and top firms are competing all the time for the best graduate and lateral talent. But it's not enough to just say that you care about gender equality to host women's events, um, or even to have a women's network. Um, in order for that to be more than window dressing, you also need to make efforts to deconstruct and improve systemic issues that prevent women from progressing. 
and which cause women and people who don't comply with societal gender, gender expectations to step away from the firm. You need to look at all your processes with a gender lens. Things like targets can help match that sort of expression of intent with accountability and structural change. You're telling your people and the market what you want to achieve. Um, and having women in visible senior positions shows that you're a meritocratic institution where women can, can succeed. And it's really important for that to be genuine and not seen as tokenistic. I think there was a recent article in the FT about how lots of companies have just one senior woman and there's this feeling of one and done when it comes to um, board appointments, which is not how you get real improvement over time. Um, Herbert Smith Freehills has a number of women in prominent positions um, and has had a number of women in, in those roles over successive promotion or election rounds. Um, this week it was announced that Rebecca Mazan Stanage um, in one of our Australian offices uh, will be appointed as the firm's senior partner. And she's not the only fe um, female voice on the firm's board um, or the only woman by any means uh, in a senior role at the firm, um, which I think is something to be you know proud of, but you know, keep, keep going in that direction. And Herbert Smith Freehills first set gender targets in 2014. The current targets state that by 2023, uh, women will comprise 35% of the firm's partner and partner leadership roles. We're currently at 26% for women partners and 23% women in leadership roles. The number of women in the partnership has increased actually by 50% since the um, 2014 targets were first published. Uh, separately, there's a target of 60-40 kind of gender split in business services. Um, so it's not always about trying to ensure that you have more women, but in some areas, um, and this is probably relevant to other industries as well, you're trying to achieve gender balance. Um, in some areas, you have historically had more women than, than men. Um, but targets alone are not enough. You can't get to 35% of partners being women if you don't have the talent pool amongst senior and mid-level associates to promote women to partnership. Herbert Smith Freehills also takes steps to address and reduce unconscious bias in decision making by training, by moderating those decisions, and their efforts to sustain the pipeline of female talent um, and the firm thinks partnership. Um, and there's a lot of care taken to maintain and review progress against those targets and report regularly to the global executive and the council on that on that progress. And in an area where you're talking about social constructs and an unconscious and implicit bias, it's important to have really transparent processes where possible um, and to use and measure objective data. I think in this area and, and maybe diversity generally, it's it's you've got to take people with you on the journey um, and uh, keeping it very objective and looking at data and showing everybody how it's all in our interests is, is, is partly how you do that. It's, you know, you don't attack anybody when you're trying to make progress um, when it comes to gender diversity. And as part of, as part of the commitment to being a positive force for change and to show leadership, um, my firm works with clients a lot on diversity issues and collaborates with them to share best practice, to promote changes. Um, I think lawyers that are not interested in diversity or think it doesn't affect them are lawyers that are going to be left behind because they're just not listening to their clients. Our clients care deeply and expect um, that their legal services providers are offering genuinely gender balanced and diverse teams. Um, and the demand coming from them is actually a really helpful driver of change. It's really useful when they say, you know, we want to see a gender balanced team and we want to see that um, that in the allocation of work, um, admin sort of management tasks are not always being allocated to women they they notice these things they pick up on them and they and they they keep us honest um so that's the work that the firm does and how we work with with clients on that when it comes to the individuals um what can we contribute what can we do the starting point is educate yourself um so that you're in a position to support others and advocate appropriately um as two things there's procedures and um policies um, and culture. Procedures and pol um, policies and uh, processes matter. Um, and you should make sure that you understand what the processes are in your organization and what's expected of you. Um, it's really important when it comes to review and promotion processes because that's the, the gateway to, to progression. Um, 
And if you understand them for yourself, you can also support other people kind of above and below you, um, your colleagues and your peers. Um, so that's processes and policies. Culture um, is a big aspect of this and you should play your part. Culture matters. It's driven from the top, but we all con contribute to the culture around us. Um, and I was thinking about five ways in which you can have an impact on culture and attitudes. Um, feedback, when you're invited to give feedback on others, including upward feedback, um, you should use that opportunity to give feedback that's constructive and useful. Um, you need to be aware of your language and your biases and how your language can impact on others. Um, but feedback is a really useful way to make sure that um, people know what's going on and issues are flagged if you're aware of issues. Equally, if people are brilliant and there's there's praise to be given, then don't hesitate in giving that praise. Um, secondly, if you experience something or hear something that makes you uncomfortable, is it appropriate to challenge it? Um, it might be appropriate in the moment or at some point afterwards. Uh, just because the moment has passed doesn't mean you can't do something. And it can be really hard to challenge microaggressions in the moment. Um, thirdly, if you see issues that you're unhappy about or something which doesn't feel right, talk to someone. It can be a peer, a trusted um, supervisor, partner or HR. Um, or if it's something that you don't want to bring up openly, every firm has a whistleblowing policy and they may have an important um, anonymous reporting line. Um, coming back to microaggressions or things said or done which are inappropriate, it can be hard for the person who's the object um, of the micro, the subject of the um, microaggression to speak up because they may fear being perceived as difficult or oversensitive. Um, and research again suggests that those aren't misplaced fears. Minorities can suffer penalties when they are calling out issues. Um, sorry, something just popped up on my screen. Um, Minorities can suffer penalties when they're calling out issues. So it's important for you to think about how you can be an ally. For example, as a man calling out a gender-based microaggression, you might not have the same concerns about being about seeming oversensitive or defensive if you're challenging a sexist comment or a microaggression. And it's important to say as well, you need to remember your professional obligations and the code of conduct may also be engaged. It's absolutely not acceptable for a client or somebody else to say, um, I want a woman, I don't want a woman, I want a man doing this. It's not um, It's not acceptable. Um, fourthly, you need to educate yourself on how to be an ally and on gender issues. Know the data and the issues at play. Um, we're celebrating International Women's Day this week, and I'm sure you've heard somebody say at some point, you know, maybe not this year, but in the past, well, what about International Women's Day? And there are three sort of ways that you can respond to that. Um, firstly, silence, ignoring it. Secondly, you can get into a longer response about entrenched patriarchy, stats on gender-based violence, and the need to recognize and address women's issues and how having an International Women's Day helps raise awareness of those issues. Um, or thirdly, you could point out quite neutrally that International Men's Day is celebrated every year in November. And which of those do you think will work best in the context of a group meeting or chats over drinks or even social media? Any one of those responses may be appropriate in, in, in any given context, but in that sort of meeting context, it's likely probably to be the neutral third, third response. Um, so think in advance about how you can help diffuse situations and deal with microaggressions in a way that shows support, doesn't make anybody feel attra attacked, um, but makes it quite clear, you know, what is acceptable and what isn't. Um, fifthly, finally, you should engage with clients on this and contribute to industry and firm initiatives. If there's a panel or a working group calling for volunteers to review a process, think about a new policy on, patern on paternal leave um, or family leave, you know, get involved and um, get involved and help to affect change if you think that change is needed. Um, so there's lots that you can be doing, um, but the starting point is educate yourself. Uh, and engage in a way which supports others. There's a lot that remains to be done, but there's a lot that we can get, you know, that we can do and we can start doing right now and it doesn't cost anything. Um, on the flip side, those individuals and firms who don't take those steps will, I think, increasingly um, find themselves left behind. Um, so that's all I had to say on um, the things that um, are going on in the market, are going on at my firm, and the things that I think that we all can do um, to support gender diversity. Thank you so much for listening to me. Back to you, Patrick. Thank you, Mel. That was um, 
a wonderful um, talk, and I think it covered so many really important um, areas of um, diversity inclusion. And I think not just gendered um, diversity, but more generally thinking about diversity and inclusion. I think important thinking about uh, diversity is important, um, but it may not necessarily be uh, comfortable when we're talking about that within within the workplace. But um, having that sense of belonging and making sure that people can bring their whole self. Um, to work is, is really um, Im important. And I think you've picked up on some of the really key issues that are out there that people are talking about at the moment around um, diversity in terms of um, unconscious bias, in terms of microaggressions, are, are really uh, big topics um, out there. And I, I think finally, just thanks for reminding us um, about gender being a, a sort of um, a social construct um, as, as well. And um, it's important for us to discuss more widely and hopefully within the panel discussion, there'll be some questions where we can talk about um, gender more, more broadly um, as well.